Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, this weekend, I um, I managed to overcome some of my, uh, we'll say, anxiety-driven inertia and just get out for a little while. Um, I drove down to Princeton on Saturday and spent an hour or so at, at Hilton's, my favorite menswear place down there, just gabbing with the owner, Nick, Nick Hilton. Um, it turned out I really needed that. Um, didn't realize how much I needed it, but we had a really great catch-up conversation and I, I bought some nice sweaters and we goofed on my hair, which is now two plus years without getting a haircut. Um, Nick also instantly ID'd the armor Lux striped shirt I was wearing, which I, I, I figured I should up my casual wear game for that visit instead of the sweatpants and cardigan that characterized my day to day life. And, um, and, and that was rewarding. He, he knew exactly what I had on. So, um, Nick Hilton, I should say, is an interesting guy. He is working on a book about his history in menswear and, um, well, in menswear. And I'm really hoping it comes to fruition. It's something he's posted pieces of in, in blog format before. And apparently there's an agent working on it. Um, I'd love to have him on the show sometime and the book would be a really neat hook for that. So anyway, we'll, we'll see. But after leaving uh, Nick's place on Witherspoon Street, I went up to Nassau Street, which is the, the main street in Princeton, so I could visit Labyrinth Books and just revel in bookstore-ishness for a while because I figured I sort of needed that. Um, thing is, the weather was beautiful, which is part of why I went out. But uh, the downside of that was Nassau Street and the whole general you know, strip at Princeton was really, really crowded and both grown-ups and, and students and such, and I just got really uncomfortable. I'm just not used to being around people. It's been a long time, and, um, yeah, it just kind of freaked me out. So even in the bookstore, it was okay, but they were busy enough that I didn't feel like they need my business to stay afloat. And more to the point, you know, I, I looked around and I thought, man, I have a lot of books at home, and I already know what the next six or seven I'm going to read are because of the show. And, you know, maybe I don't need to to have the bookstore experience as much as I thought. I did still play the game of uh, what will be the first book I see by an author I've recorded with. Uh, it was a split decision. I happened to notice the paperback of Harold Bloom's last book and uh, Philip Lopate's edited Glorious uh, American Essays collection right next to each other. So Bloom and Lopate were my uh, my winners for that one. But anyway, I split the store without buying anything, went over to Palmer Square, figuring I'd get a coffee at Rojas, but um, they only do curbside, and that area was super crowded, so I just I just got in the car and went home. But but still, it was good to like go somewhere and shoot the breeze with someone from, you know, before the war, as it were, and just see something different than, you know, my yard and my, my neighbor's houses. There was no point or moral to this. I just figured I'd share a little something of my life with you. But that gets us to this week's show, where we go from my micro life to a much more macro level subject. Um, my guest is the cartoonist Daryl Cunningham, who was on uh, last year with his book Billionaires. This time around, he has a brand new graphic biography, uh, same as Billionaires. It's from Drawn and Quarterly. This one is Putin's Russia, The Rise of a Dictator. Now, in Billionaires, Daryl profiled several of the, the mega rich and the corrosive influence they've had on the world. And this time around, he goes above and beyond that to explore Vladimir Putin's life and influence on Russia and the world to, well, to get at some of Putin's motivations, sort of. Um, see, understanding Putin and knowing his upbringing and his history before and during his his reign is important to, to try to guess or, or game out where Russia is going. It, 
as I record this, um, there are, it is February 15th, 2022 for you time travelers out there. There are hints that Putin may be withdrawing troops from the border of Ukraine after a massive buildup that seemed to threaten invasion of the, the former Soviet Republic, where some of my family is from. Um, in the book, Daryl, it goes back to what we know of Putin's childhood and, and the start of his KGB career and his, his rise to power. And he seeks to help us, well, to, to, to sort of explain who Putin is and how he figures into a certain Russian tradition and what he wants and the, the risks the West takes and, and has taken in, in misjudging his goals. It's really a, a fascinating deep dive into a figure who's trying to change the course of history. And Daryl's balance of text, image, and graphic design in his cartooning, he's just at another level. Uh, over the course of the, the nonfiction works he's done in his career, this one's really a, a peak in that he manages to, to generate something that's supremely readable, but incredibly tense as a story of, of Putin's role in, in, modern, in Russia's modern history and his regime's atrocities and, and assassinations around the world. It's um, it's a remarkable and compelling book. So I hope you check out Putin's Russia, The Rise of a Dictator by Daryl Cunningham from Drawn and Quarterly. Now, here's Daryl's bio. Daryl Cunningham is the cartoonist of six nonfiction books, including Super Crash, How to Hijack the Global Economy, Billionaires, and most, re most recently, Putin's Russia, The Rise of a Dictator. His comics explore subjects as diverse as mental health, science, economics, and politics. He has given talks to the London School of Economics and the City of Arts and Lights, Valencia. In 2015, he was one of 30 world-renowned photographers, painters, sculptors, writers, filmmakers, and musicians who were invited to contribute to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Art of Saving a Life Project to promote vaccination in the developing world. In 2018, he was awarded an honorary degree of Master of Arts from Leeds Arts University. And now, the 2022 Virtual Memories Conversation with Daryl Cunningham. Tell me where Putin's Russia began for you as a book, and then we'll talk about where it began for you in terms of thought, but where the book uh, began. As a joke, funny enough, because after Billionaires, after the book Billionaires, I did a, a book called Billionaires, also offered from D&Q and Myriad Editions in the UK, um, which is about the 1%, basically. It's a, it's a book that particularly looks at um, four people in particular, the Koch brothers who are oil and gas billionaires, Jeff Bezos, of course, Amazon, and Rupert Murdoch of News Corp fame. And uh, I was looking at their power they had welded and how they'd got to the positions where, where they were in. And... Um, after that, in interviews, people kept asking me, what were you going to do next, you know? And I had no idea, really. But as a joke, I kept saying, like, Putin, maybe Putin, or maybe I'll do a book, a book on Putin. And then eventually I thought, well, maybe I should do a book on Putin, because that does seem like a fascinating subject and, and an interesting sort of uh, extra, if you like, to billionaires, because unofficially Putin is probably... Oh, it's impossible to estimate how much money he actually has because essentially uh, any asset that belongs to Russia, effectively, as he's the dictator, belongs to him. So, um, you know, people estimate that he could um, um, be as wealthy as like 20 billion, which puts him up in the top five richest people in the world and not... No one ever really thinks of him in those terms, but he is phenomenally wealthy. I mean, him and his crime cartel have basically been ransacking the country for two decades of all its oil and gas reserves and other aspects of the state. So, you know, no one stopped them doing that. So they just kept doing it. And that's, I mean, you, you have a section near the end of the book where you really kind of encapsulate that both as a concept and, you know, what some of the material signs of that 
look like, um, which is pretty amazing. I, I'd wondered if this was sort of a compliment to billionaires or, you know, whether this becomes the first uh, book in the trillionaires series for you. I, well, I think so you have to see Putin uh, as essentially part of the whole uh, billionaire, Claire, billionaire class problem that the world has and that you have uh, a small number of people with colossal outsized influence on the rest of us. They still have so much money, they're basically distorting uh, our media, our entire political systems. They're basically dictating the conversation because they own virtually everything. They own retail, the media. Um, it all comes back to... Um, and then we haven't really dealt very well with these huge monopolies that are owned. And if we lived, we really genuinely believed in free markets, we would break them up to make it easier for other things to happen. I'm not really... Trust me. I mean, people have said, oh, are you against uh, people being super rich? I'm not against people being rich. I'm just against people being rich above a certain level. I'm fine with people making millionaires, making themselves multi-millionaires. But multi-billionaires, that's incredibly damaging to us, it turns out. Yeah. When their biggest goal is, you know, how to go up into space for three minutes at a time and, you know, shoot rockets at, at Mars and such. Or we see some of the, the, the stranger pursuits that some of these guys pursue around the, the well, anyway, we'll get into the whole Jeffrey Epstein thing in a completely different podcast, I'm sure, down the line. But but what really surprised or, or shocked you in the process of working on this book and the research that you, you did going into it? Well, I knew very little about Putin's childhood, so that was very interesting to me. And you can kind of see how the character of the man was formed in the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, he grew up in what was then um, um, Leningrad. Leningrad. Yeah, Leningrad. Uh, <laughs> no, St. Petersburg. But uh, Leningrad just after the war, and uh, his parents were caught up in the siege of Leningrad and almost starved to death basically, uh, because they were surrounded by Russian, uh, German forces, and his uh, father was uh, part of like um, um, like a KGB sort of um, offshoot, really, like a military arm, and he was badly injured uh, in that, uh, that conflict. So it was interesting to sort of read about how he grew up on sort of very rough, like... Um, um, these like tower blocks with uh, in sort of street gangs, and he had to basically fight. You know, he was a really little, a little kid, but he was tenacious and ferocious, and uh, um, a, a good street fighter, according to people who grew up with him at that time. And uh, he's taken those kind of uh, aggressive skills into politics with him, so you can see how the man was formed really from that. <laughs> do Do you see? Parallels. Uh, I, I asked because my mom was born 1940 in London, and my dad was 38 in in Bucharest, and then he was a refugee after that. The experience of post-war privation in the West. You know, did you have stories from your parents at all, or any idea of what you know how those things may have? I don't want to say paralleled, but you know what similarities there may have been. Well, you then... know, in terms of how everybody recovered from the war. Britain obviously didn't suffer as much as um, those in sure. the rest of Europe. I and mean, we had, obviously, there were blockades, stopped food coming in. So there was um, extreme rationing. And so my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation had to suffer, you know, uh, that. And But it wasn't, uh, and obviously there was the blitz and all that. Uh, my my, my Mother told tell stories about hiding, you know, in the cellar during the uh, air raids and that kind of thing in Newcastle where she grew up. But um, you know, um, I don't think um, our population was quite as traumatized as like some populations were traumatized in Europe. So it's not quite the same thing. But I think um, the sort of forties, the people who lots of became parents in the sixties were really looking for much more stability because they'd grown up in an era where there was just chaos. Uh, 
So I think there was like that tendency in my parents' generation and probably Putin's generation to look for stability to try and get, you know, to grit to to get hold of the chaos really, and uh, you know, to, so maybe that's in his mind as well. Yeah, I mean, again, evincing itself differently, and you know, you're in a different cultural mindset, and the amount of losses that Russia suffered is, you know, immense compared to to you know what the UK or US you know dealt with. But but yeah, I wondered about that sense of what you know surviving the war and rebuilding after you know what what forms those take and we see what it you know how it shapes his mind i mean you you really portray in the book that sense of i would say the betrayal of the end of the cold war yeah i think and, that, that actually know. more than the war the collapse of the soviet union seems to have greatly affected him psychologically we can see now that the whole ukraine thing at the bottom of that is his effort to re get this, get russia back to um control of the same land control as the, as the old soviet union as he's trying to rebuild the soviet union as it used to be and get control of these satellite com countries again so everything that they lost they want back he wants back basically that's that seems to be driving him he's an old paid kgb guy you know, he still thinks in old Cold War terms. For him, the Cold War never finished, really. He was finishing old business here with this. And that's what's going on in Eastern Europe right now, really. And um, we not, have not properly understood this, I think, the best. Um, we're happy to take uh, Russian oil money, masses of it, and uh, that's... Uh, been a problem and continues to be a problem, but um, we can't... Um, you know, if someone's being aggressive, you can't just turn away. You have to stand up to it, however difficult that might be. Yeah. And you really capture that also, that sense of misjudging over those first 10, 12 years, you know, up through the Ukraine invasion um, or the Crimea uh, uh, invasion and, and annexation. That sense where we were like, yeah, you know, this this is internal and they're they're still just figuring things out with Russia. It's all post, you know, CIS where they're they're breaking down into uh you know constituent countries. Yeah, well that that's obviously I think people have woken up now and realized there's quite a serious problem there and uh, we should stand up to it. And I'm I'm glad to see that now uh there's real talk of uh, sanctions being ta uh, economic sanctions being taken against because obviously like America and uh, um, England, London in particular and New York have got a, um, a lot of Russian money wrapped up in like real estate and other places that belong, you know, that's basically Russian money and uh, so they're quite vulnerable to there but we've been so greedy in the west we've just been happy to take the money and not really think about what it means when this russian money has been pouring into our political system often and uh, distorting it for and i mean I'm talking about i'm talking really as an englishman and the effect that uh, russian money allegedly has had, has had on brexit yeah. which is still we still don't really know the depth of that there are very yeah, didn't, case you, going on. Right? There's a court case going on now, which we yeah. can't really talk about, which um, is a, right at the bottom of this, really. Um, yeah, because you, you, I mean, you spend uh, time working on the, the the Trump side of things, and I was like, yeah, I know there's a Brexit angle too, but it's probably either too murky or too complicated to, yeah, to I was dive into. I'm nervous of discussing that, but also. Um, the book had to end, you know, and yeah. they cut somewhere <laughs> to decide because it, it's this issue like affects so much stuff everywhere uh, that um, you have to. Uh, and, you know, I couldn't keep on writing the book forever. So I had to make judicious. Um, uh, I had to think very carefully about what I would have to leave out. What was the most important thing? I mean, Brexit as well is probably another book, which I don't want to do. But one day I might have to do it. Yeah, that that, that was my next question. Um, but I, I guess along those lines, you know, were there things you, you know, you had to cut for legalities sake, not necessarily Brexit related, but were there things where it's like, yeah, I could potentially get in trouble 
you know, legally for this, as opposed to, well, we get to, we'll talk about the other sorts of trouble people get into when they they. Well, there's um, um, a British journalist recently, Catherine Belton, I think it was. She um, and I drew on some of her research. She basically accused one of the oligarchs um, of basically uh, the situation was that. It's generally thought that if you're an oligarch in Russia, you're basically holding money for Putin. This is the alleged, the ele what was alleged really. And this oligarch mm. says, well, no, this money is mine. I don't hold it for anyone else. You know, I'm not over on Putin's back and go, blah, blah, blah. So he took Catherine Belton to court. This court case is now finished and she had to cut certain bits from her book, I think, because uh, she didn't get... So her publisher stood by her and... Um, I can't remember the name of the book, unfortunately, but um, I think it's Putin's people. The, the one upshot of doing these uh, remotely is I can look things up on the, the computer while we're, we're talking. So it's a very yeah. good book, anyway. So I recommend that book, and I men mention it in uh, my references. But, yeah, how uh, long did the book take to? Oh, sorry, go on. About two years, but it, it's a short book than I've normally done. Uh, but it took the same length of time because I took time off to do other projects, so sort of here and there because I needed to you know, obviously make some money. Uh, so, um, yeah, it took about two years. And then at the end of it, I thought, well, probably the last nonfiction book I'll do for a while, because I was very burned out after it, after doing that book, I think. It was really hard work. It's the hardest work I've done on a book, I think. It was more, so. more than any other book I've done. It was more of a collaborative effort with me and my editor at myriad editions and the fact checker there so we 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 were very careful about what we put in the book and how we presented things we went over and over it you know so it was a it's an incredibly uh difficult um process which i found like you know, it sort of pummeled me a bit really so after that was a bit traumatized really and is that tied primarily to to uk libel laws which are stricter i think than than us yeah, ones from everything i've read libel laws are ridiculous really um you know i mean you have to really um anywhere else you if you get sued it's on the person to prove that you have done something but in england in it tends to be the other way around. You have to prove that you haven't done it, and that's much harder. So, um, so people tend to uh, internationally. People tend to try and sue for libel in um, British courts if they can, because they know that it'll be easier that way. What what patterns emerged over the course of the research? What things did you see that you you weren't necessarily expecting going in, you know, in terms of the, the, yeah, they do this again and again, um, or generally, yeah. What, what sort of patterns arose? How money has been used as war with, as a war mm -hmm. weapon really to basically, um, you know, buy or bribe people, bribe politicians, um, often without them really realizing where the money has exactly come from, how political systems can be subverted very easily because people, you know, especially in a Western system, always looking money, to, looking for money to so, sort of, um, you know, um, fund political campaigns. It's hard to know sometimes where that money has exactly come from and people are not always looking carefully enough and that's very dangerous, I think. And that comes up time and time again, you know, the, the money uh, situation. Yeah, that's... I will say from my day job as a... where I'm registered as a lobbyist with the U.S. government, I discovered... Uh, early on what you well what campaign finance laws in this country are like because i made a innocent comment about like how to donate how i, I wanted to donate money to a, a, a congressional candidate and it turns out it was completely illegal and these guys actually called rather than email because they didn't want anything in writing but just to explain to me you can't do that that would get you thrown in prison and us in major trouble I'm like oh I just didn't know. I'm I'm a newbie to this whole thing. Thanks for straightening it out. But you realize there are a lot of other surreptitious methods and a lot of more uh, people who well, have less scruples than I do. Yeah, there are lots of ways around it. You can 
that the things called super packs, which are yeah, and that kind of thing, which are basically fronts for campaigns. Um, it's there are all sorts of different ways people get around it. I mean, you know, and we have the same problem in in the UK in the um, forum money in technically shouldn't be allowed to interfere in um, elections, but uh, it does happen anyway. Yeah, it's um, we'd always say it's an insolvable problem, but that's because the laws get written by the people who benefit from getting the donations and contributions. So it becomes unsolvable because of who's in charge of solving it, as opposed to being a real problem. Absolutely. Yeah. So beyond the legal and libel worries, writing a book about Vladimir Putin, did it worry you? At all, in terms of personal safety? No. I, mean, I know the assassination attempts have been on Russian nationals in the UK, but, you know, well, any fear of polonium tea? Um, or anything? Serge Skripal, um, who was like, I hope I mis- got his name correct, I probably haven't. But um, he was the guy who was poisoned in Salisbury, an assassination attempt on him, uh, using like a, a very dangerous nerve agent and... Uh, he survived it and his daughter. They basically, assassins came and painted his door handle in Salisbury in England, where he was living, with this nerve agent. And uh, him and his daughter came out, got it on their hands, a very minute amount, uh, literally atoms of this um, substance, and it nearly killed them. And when the police went round... To the house, the investigating officer himself, had, who touched the handle, became seriously injured. The assassins had come directly from um, Russia and uh, later stayed that they'd actually gone to Salisbury to look at the cathedral. Uh, and um, they, yeah, when I, there is an, a YouTube video where they talk about it and it's laughably ridiculous. But anyway, um, they... Um, they used like a, a perfume bottle, I think, to spray it on. And then instead of getting rid of it in a proper way, they just threw it in some bin somewhere, like a trash can. And uh, uh, a local guy, guy picked it up and he gave this perfume bottle to um, his girlfriend. And she was the only casualty. She died uh, from this. And he became seriously ill himself. So a completely innocent person was killed from this botched assassination attempt, which is basically a nerve agent attack on the UK. Quite brazen, and not the the only one that's happened either. Other people have been killed in the UK. Uh, So if you're like, um, I mean, in this case, this was like a double agent who'd like relocated to the UK and was supposed to be living undercover somewhere. Uh, But also... um, you know, um, 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 a lot of reporters have been assassinated over the years as well. Um, and so, you know, um, it's very dangerous uh, to report on it in Russia, uh, the situation. I mean, I don't feel any personal danger myself because I'm very much small fry. You know, the, if you look out on the... Bookshelves in, in the library. There's tons of books written about Putin already. All those people are perfectly fine. So you know, I'm like, you know, I'm not on the radar in any way. You know, these are the people who have been uh, attempted to be assassinated or have been killed. Uh, you know, are much more high profile within Russia and that kind of thing. So I don't really think of that. People make jokes about it to me, which I think is very poor taste. But uh, no, I don't feel any danger myself. What was the the vibe in the UK over these assassinations and assassination attempts? Was there a sense of this is a real, um, I want to say uh, not travesty, but you know, a, a, a you know, an attack on our our country? In no, a it sense. was portrayed by the media as almost um, you know, it's a, laughable. It's like a um, you know, an uh, basically part of it, like an espionage thing. It's um, mm. entirely to do with, you know, spies and that kind of thing. You know, they didn't 
portray it as a kind of attack on our country, but I think it should have been seen in that way. Well, it's certainly the Prime Minister at the time, Theresa May, like, uh, kicked out loads of people from the Prussian Embassy and other people. Uh, but other than that, nothing really happened, you know. Um, they are, well, you know, they could have done a lot of more serious economic sanctions in, against Russia, but they didn't do anything, really. Basically because, you know, greed, really. We quite like having that money, it seems, and it's more important than uh, national security. I get you. I mean, you capture a chunk of what the, the the previous administration here was like, and the the split between Trump and you know his own people in terms of responding to, to Russian aggression and activities. But uh, yeah, I it's um, right. Trump to some extent. Yeah, I had to uh, really. I didn't really want to write about him as one of those things, but he's inevitably yeah. part of the this story. And uh, we'll probably never really know what the heck Trump's relationship with Putin is. Uh, yeah, you had a line in there about how time will tell. I'm like, oh, I don't think we'll ever know for real. But well, who knows? But, yeah. um, you know, he, uh, he might have a deathbed confession or something. <laughs> he seems to have a compulsion to confess anyway. You know, he literally yeah. says straight out what I'm going to do, even if it means breaking the law, because he knows perfectly well people aren't going to act on it. So he has right. that um, narcissist uh, compulsion to confess. So you never can tell. So um, um, so anyway, something uh, some seems like uh, the um, Kremlin has some kind of hold on P P Trump uh, more than yeah. I can answer because his behaviour and his attitude towards uh, Russia is very strange and he's incredibly unwilling ever to criticize Putin personally. In fact, I've never known it happen. Literally, on all the stuff that I've read up on, he never criticizes Trump. In fact, goes out of his way to make excuses for, for, for Putin, rather, which yeah. is very extraordinary considering, you know, the, the situation, the world situation. Right. You know, and giving interviews where well, anyway, uh, we can all tell stories of, of our, our collective trauma of those years. But but I guess, you know, one of my questions, you know, is seeing the, the crisis point we're currently at with Ukraine and this this massive of Soviet or Russian buildup on the, the borders. Do you feel that the work you've done on the book, you know, I don't want to say gives you insight, but, you know, do you, do you feel like you get what the motivations are and what the, the game is that he is or isn't playing. It's a really important, I mean, I'm really loath to try and guess what's really sure. going on because it just it could be saber rattling, just saber rattling where he's just trying to push um, with West and NATO in particular um, to see how much you can get. Because the thing about authoritarian regimes and the dictators is that they'll just go and do things. They'll push to see what they can get away with. And if they don't get a response, they'll just push further. This happens all the time. And so he's just pushing to see how much he can get away with. But the danger there, if this is just like him trying the situation, is that, you know, things can spiral out of control. We know, you know, if you build up uh, armies on either side any border, things can spin out of control very easily. So it's a dangerous situation, it's a dangerous game to play for uh, all of us, really. So I'm, I'm hoping it'll die down eventually when he realizes that um, there's just a limit to what, how far yeah. the West is going to be pushed here, really. Or that his attempt at splitting NATO actually seemed to have fortified fact, it um, or yeah, brought, yeah. brought companies or countries together. Ukraine, he started to, uh, before they, he's already invaded Ukraine, it's not like it's it's going yeah. to happen, it's already partially happened in Crimea. Before that invasion, um, most of the Ukraine population were you know, not that interested in joining NATO. Now the majority are interested in joining. So the quite the opposite has happened to what he would have liked, really. In fact, he's shored up uh, opposition against him by doing this, really. If you'd taken a more subtle approach, I don't know, uh, maybe he could have gone his way. But um, uh, I don't know. I think we're coming to the end of how far he can really push without serious military action.
and I right. I don't think he'll. My gut feeling is that he's even he's not that irresponsible. It's just too dangerous. Yeah, you'd think. Although the real you'd think question is, did you think going into cartooning this was the sort of subject matter you'd be discussing with people in in interviews about your work? No, not at all. I really started <laughs> off doing sort of. Um, I was very influenced by people like Eddie Campbell. So I, um, English cartoonist uh, from uh, started off in the eighties, really in a small English small, small press. And so I was sort of doing auto bio stuff and the later on in fiction. It's only because of other work I did later on. Um, I did work in mental health for some years, and when I came out of that, I wanted to do a book. Wanted to do a book about mental health which meant talking about my, it started off as an autobar book and then became a book about different types of uh, mental illnesses and me trying to write a book to uh, get rid of a, uh, of a lot of the stigma that surrounds um, it takes, um, mental illnesses. So I wrote a book called uh, Psychiatric Tales, which is like, it breaks down in different chapters, looking at different psychiatric illnesses like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and uh, those kind of illnesses. So that's how I started to become someone who took these really big subjects in non-fiction and started to boil them down and explain them. So since then, it's like every book I've, I've taken a sort of really big subject and then sort of boiled it down to try and explain it really in the best way I can. So I've become sort of the person who does that kind of thing. Um, I wish there were a few other people around to do that, but not that many, I think. Now I kind of feel, uh, I've been doing the Putin book, I've reached the end of that like phase and uh, I want to go back to doing some sort of actual fiction again, uh, take a complete different, different change. And we'll, talk about that in a moment because you've had a ongoing project through patreon that i've been grooving on for for a while now but but i wanted to ask in relation to, to this book putin's russia you know were there moments that stretched you as a cartoonist you know you, you mentioned the intense research that went into everything were there aspects of it in terms of the visuals and the storytelling that kind of pushed you past what you were accustomed to um, very much because I'm not really, um, I'm not a good caricaturist. I'm not, I find people's likeness is very difficult to get. And so I had to struggle hard with that. And that's not something that ever comes naturally to me. Some aspects of car cartooning just come straight to me. I'm very good at drawing uh, buildings and landscapes and that kind of thing. In, uh, but I'm not good particularly in making people, um, if they're real people, drawing them from panel to panel, it's very difficult to make them consistent. So I found that very hard. And there's a lot of photo reference in it, which uh, as I'm uneasy about, but it was literally the only way that I could do it because uh, it had to be, it couldn't be cartoony in a traditional mm. sense, mostly. It had to be a more accurate, illustrative type of book because of the serious nature of the material. I didn't want it to come across as comic in any way, although there are some... Um, there are a couple of visual elements, like the, his, his nose in one of them, the long arm uh, yeah, image a few times. Yeah. They are more cartoony, but generally speaking, yeah. I try to keep to... But uh, they're sparse in the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they keep to a more, you know... Um, straight a naturalistic documentary style so but that i found very hard really uh, so it did push me quite hard toughest part of putin to draw uh, of his face it's, it's, it's very, is it just keeping proportion is it it's just well, trying anyway. to make sure it still looks like him somehow um you've just got to like with jeff bezos with billionaires the previous book after a while it's like a bald head, big ears, <laughs> you know. You can just yeah. get away with a little, uh, you know. Shorthand. Shorthand. Yeah. But with Putin, it's more, you can't really do that. He has a very specific look, so you have to be, you know, I couldn't do like a, a shorthand. I did a little bit here and there, but mostly 
Um, I've tried to do an accurate dis, dis, depiction of him, really. Yeah. And as you know, I, I took up drawing in the past year and stupidly actually made my first comic about a, a week ago. And I'm re, well, I'm reverse engineering everything you guys have spent decades figuring out. I'm sitting there like, I don't know how you actually get a face to look like the same face from one panel to the next. So, yeah, it's um, my hat's off to you just with a challenge like this in particular, trying to... to keep the um keep the gravity of the situation while still you know working in the, the you know the comic visual mode so uh, uh, my other question about the book though i'm in the acknowledgments and and we're keeping up the trend of every book that has me in the acknowledgments i do get the author on, on the show of course but um i'm flattered and touched to, to have seen my name in there unless it's another gil roth you're you're no you know, there are there's only one it's like <laughs> yeah, it's like highlander so there's only one <laughs> no um but um i try to uh, thank as many people as as possibly can and everybody who was like um signed up to my patreon got mentioned as well so okay. yeah you get yeah. double yeah uh, not just for being a patron but obviously because of your interest in my work and so yeah. on cool. i appreciate it and again I'm, I'm awfully glad to to you know help you and and you know work with the the, the books and drawn in quarterly etc but but it does raise the uh, the the Patreon thing uh, does does lead us to you getting away from nonfiction and the new project you've been should we say serializing? Yeah, I've been yeah. So you've been putting out a page, a page uh, 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 not every day, but ne almost nearly every day. I've been trying to do a page and then putting it on my Patreon of this nonfiction. Um, yeah, no, it's a fiction book um, yeah. that I'm working on called Far Beyond Midnight, which is basically sort of deep dive into supernatural horror. It's basically a kind of soap opera about a family dealing with a series of supernatural crises. And the inspiration for this was originally um, a TV series, an old TV series called Dark Shadows, which yeah. a, day, a daytime show before I was even um, aware of TV it was on, really. It was, uh, uh, so it was the late 60s, early 70s. I think there's a Tim Burton movie on basically since. But I saw some... Uh, a lot of episodes on Amazon Prime. They kept showing them on Amazon Prime, and I thought, "Oh, this is really." It was incredibly cheaply made, and uh, I think uh, it's one of those situations where the budget was so low they only had a chance to uh, do a couple of takes each time. So often, huge mistakes are still in the show. <laughs> and despite the fact that they. Um, it looks very amateurish. There's only about three or four sets. Uh, they were incre the writers were incredibly imaginative. And uh, so I was really taken by that. And I thought, oh, I'd like to do something like that. So based on that. And also, I have an interest in sort of um, military history as well. So um, although it's not come up in the book yet, there's going to be a large section about the aftermath of the... Um, uh, Napoleonic Wars in the book as well, um, which I was able to take a lot of my interests and sort of start pouring them in into this book, uh, interests in sort of uh, English folklore stuff is coming up. Uh, and so, with, you know, again, I, I, I use my usual skills. Of, I, I do a lot. I'm still doing a lot of research, but the difference between uh, this and obviously and the nonfiction work is I can just make everything up. Which is incredibly freeing. I could after after so many years of uh, doing non-fiction books, is that I can now just do whatever I like. I don't have to worry about whether it's true or not. And know how it ends. Uh, yeah, because uh, the whole story is yeah. written yeah. Uh, in quite detail. I wrote it as a prose story first, so I'm gradually just adapting that and making additions and subtractions as I'm going along. Um, I need a little work on. I need to do a little work on the ending in my own mind because I don't think it's quite right. But it'll be at least a year before I get there drawing it, so I've got time to figure it out. What's the turnover time been between you finishing a page and posting it on Patreon? Sometimes just because I can't. Hour. Yeah, I can't tell if you are literally making the book 
pretty much every day and and posting something new, which would make its own interesting comic in and of itself. A guy who's doing this and and trying to get these pages out, you know, and, and make his first. Well, I usually uh, post the same day as I finished yeah. it, or the day after. So I've got one almost finished on my iPad now. Really, I'm, I'm holding you back. I feel bad, but <laughs> yeah, I've got time to finish it today. I think. Yeah. And what's that process been like in terms of working in that, that, you know, A, working in fiction, B, you know, working in these single page modes and, you know, posting, getting some audience or reader feedback almost. I don't get a you know, lot of feedback account. from Patreon, but which I could do with a bit more sometimes. But, and occasionally I've gone through periods where I thought, or maybe it's no good and start to down myself. But uh, generally speaking, I'm very confident that it's a good story and it's working well. And uh, just to keep going with it, really, uh, even though um, eventually a publisher will pick this up and it will go and it will be looked at by an editor and then we'll sort of really look at the structure of it again, I think, because uh, there may be some structural issues in there. There may be some stuff not necessary. I may need to insert some more stuff. I don't know. So you've got to, the stuff are, as it is on Patreon right now, you've got to look at the, uh, as, as if it's the beta version of the book. Yeah. Uh, the, the eventual published version may look. And even in, in that format, you know, the, the comments you sometimes post when you're putting up an image where you're discussing how, well, actually back on page 53, I did this, but, you know, when we finalize it, I'm going to, to have to change X, Y, and Z. That sort of process of of on-the-fly revision, the whole creative process of it, I find fascinating. And I have to admit, I read it uh, by the emails that I get from Patreon, so I rarely go to the site, which is why I don't leave comments or likes, et cetera. Most so. people do it, yeah. Yeah. But trust me, I am reading it. I am enjoying it each day. And right. At the same time, want to, want to peeved it. that you're able to do this almost every single day. That's that's what it really just bothers me because I'm so unproductive. But you know, that's that's neither here nor there. So. Well, it's only because at the moment I've got no illustration work to do, so I'm sort of free of that. Hmm. Um, but um, if other stuff come up, there'll, there'll probably be a break. Have there been any queries about other nonfiction? projects have you had to, to turn anything down at this point or is, or has the stuff generally been more originated from you no i haven't done uh, uh, i haven't been doing anything else for the past mm -hmm. six months just this project really uh, last year i was quite busy with all sorts of things uh, um, apart from finishing up putin i did a, a short comic um, which was basically uh, about the NHS, the yeah. National Health Service in um, in Britain, and uh, also did uh, a, a short comic, which is part of an anthology. Um, uh, I can't remember the title of it now, but anyway, it was about um, universal basic in um, income. Oh, income. Yeah, and sort of looking at the in pros and cons of that as an interesting thing that people could try. I don't think it will ever happen, but um, theoretically, it's a good idea. We experimented a bit with the uh, the child tax credit here in the U.S. during the pandemic, but of course, they let that lapse because, you know, we don't want these people just getting money and not going to work because freedom, which raises the question, you're, you're staying in America now uh you've you've lived here in the past on and off what are you really noticing in terms of differences between uk and us as you've you've been here for a bit now um well in new york it's a lot more strict yeah. uh, um the covid restrictions are a lot more strict than they are in the uk which they're basically given up altogether it sounds like so i was surprised to if I wanted to eat in a restaurant, I had to show my vaccination cards and ID and that kind of thing. And uh, masks are required still everywhere. And I think in the UK, when I go back to the UK, I'm going to have to go back to the UK quite soon, actually, much sooner than I would, would have liked. Um, I think they're about to lift all restrictions everywhere, despite the fact that the pandemic is not really over, uh, because it's become, you know, politically 
untenable for the current government, which is in such incredible disarray anyway, as we know. (laughs) Every morning when I wake up, it's uh, I get up pretty early. So I see U.S. well, East Coast 5 a.m. Twitter, which is 10 or 11 a.m. UK Twitter. So I, I tend to get the political comments from the UK are, are what's flooding my feed at that hour. And it's um, just every day, another, another shit storm waiting for Boris Johnson to, to step down or just burn the government to the ground. But well, yeah, he's uh, not going to go willingly. I think he has that Trump mindset and authoritarian time, so, which means he thinks he can just wait it out and fire everybody under him. Yeah. But uh, we'll see. I mean, the Conservative Party have their own power base. And if it looks after the coming, um, if you, we have the equivalent of midterm elections coming up in May. And if the Conservative Party do badly in that, he's basically finished. He couldn't survive that. Yeah. And yet we always say this, but, you know, anyway, I, I've, I've learned from the last bunch of years that the... Um, Lack of shame will just keep you going and going and going in some political systems. But like you said, when it's your own guys turning on you, that's when it's going to be a... Well, if they look um, like they're going to... If they have... If Boris Johnson looks like he could lose a general election, it's over, basically. Because they'll want someone who... They want a winner. And the Conservative Party has turned on their leaders before. They turned on Margaret Thatcher because they yeah. got to a point where they realised she couldn't win an election. So even though she's been colossally successful for them, they got rid of her in a minute. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's oh, well, yeah, we have different political systems in that parliamentary sense that, uh, yeah, make things very, um, give yeah. us some contrast with, with what things look like. With a prime minister we never voted for, yeah. But you couldn't end up with a president exactly that you can vote for. Well, technically, we ended up with Ford, who was an appointed oh, vice president who took over for Nixon. That's the only one that's like, yeah. there was really no election that involved Ford until 76 when he lost. Ford but... is the president everyone forgets, really. Yeah. Well, that, that was the Saturday Night Live debut president. So it's the only reason I remember it. I was four or five years old at the time. But anyway, it's it's neither here nor there. But... But I guess the question with, with something like Far Beyond Midnight, are you enjoying it? Oh, very much so, yeah. It's, yeah. it's also, I'm able to um, to get away from a lot of uh, the photo references I was obliged to do on Putin and just go back to just straightforward traditional cartooning, you know, just uh, look at references, but then just make up my own thing, uh, get an idea for something, just sketch it up. You know, just pure drawing, really. Pure drawing and cartooning in the way that I really want to do it. And also, it's just improved my drawing as well. I've got all these pages I'm doing everywhere day. I can see uh, the growth of the drawing still. And that's the thing about drawing. It doesn't matter. I'm in my early 60s, incredibly. I find that incredible. But, uh, but you know, there's no, no point in your life you still can't learn. You still improve. You know, no matter you look at the masters like uh, Kirby and Mike Mignola these days, and even in the latter stages, you know, of their of their life, they're still improving. You can always still improve. It's quite incredible, really. Yeah, yeah it's uh, like I said, my 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 artistic stuff is you know amateur completely, but you know, realizing at fifty something that I could learn to see and and you know draw and and just you know make an adjustment like that or a change like that at this point in my life was was pretty astonishing it's actually something i brought up with i can't remember if we talked about it uh bill griffith uh yeah. zippy yeah. the pinhead cartoonist where i told him one of the things i marveled over with the recent years is just how incredibly tight all the hatching is and how beautifully finished everything is I said, because, you know, to me, I would think the older you get, you know, you'd start going with a sort of shorthand or looser. And he's like, no, no, you just get better and better every year if you never take a break and you do this for 30 years straight. I'm like, OK, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Um, that's that's, you know, how he 
progressed with it was just, you know, you keep sticking at this. You don't go for shortcuts. You you go for making this as, as good as it can be. And your skills of doing that get better and better. So Yeah, if you draw every day, you can really see the difference. It starts, it's incremental, but you look back and you think, oh my gosh, it's really happening. Now I've got her into a really good flow with this story. And I think my drawing is as good as, as, be, as good as it's ever been, if not better, really. Had you ever thought about a daily strip? I'd do one if such things were... Um, I know it's not even a thing anymore, I really. Thing but... Anymore, but I would do one. You know, I mean, I really admire daily strips, and um, I've in the past I've had collections of like Dick Tracy, and I've got collections of Nancy and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, who were the the besides Eddie Campbell, of course, who was our god, uh, the the really formative cartoonists th- when you were? I think um, the first cartoonist I ever really became my god was Jack Kirby. Well, so obviously I draw nothing like him, think nothing like him, but it's just the, um, you look at his work and you think, uh, you know, it opens up what is possible. Anything basically is possible, you realise. And uh, you don't even have to draw naturalistically. You can draw even badly, but sometimes Kirby drew badly, but such was his incredible style. He made it work for him anyway. Yeah, you know, it's just like incredible, really. The incredible power of someone, as you say, who drew every day for decades, and then had this incredible ability at the end of it. By 1969, he could just do anything he liked, really. If he thought of it, he could draw it because he'd drawn everything, right. you know, multiple times. Oh, when you uh, think of those early Marvel days, where he's you know putting out a 24-page comic in the span of I don't know a week, basically, that he could just produce pages that were that good with with that that speed is just incredible and then again what you gain from doing that again and again and again yeah and other people have influenced me john porcelino's really influenced me as a completely the opposite end of that scale really how simple you can go how uh, not just in the drawing which is you know if there was any less lines on it there wouldn't be anything there but also <laughs> in terms of how simple you can make the writing and still have the deep thought and deep soul in it. And that's always interesting to me as well. So it showed the other way, really. And recently, I've been very impressed by Kilo Roberts' work. Um, uh, I read, what is it? Um, am I talking about? Um, Kyler? Kyler, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she's she's one of my all time faves yeah. and a great guest for the, the show. Also, the new one is my begging chart. I bought a book immediately, and uh, I was really impressed by it. the sheer the stillness of it. They're taking the looking at because more a lot of cartooning, especially um, superhero cartooning, is about movement and action and that. But her work is very much about the still moments of life. You know, the little details and the incidents which sort of pile up to virtual domestic life, really. And all that's sort of fascinating to me. Really. Uh, I couldn't do what she does, but um, I can learn from it. Yeah. yeah. Have you thought of more autobio work? I've thought of it. I mean, there's some stuff that um, my partner says, oh, you should, uh, when I discuss things that happened to me in the past or, you know, st- uh, my child and things like that. So, oh, you should do a strip about that. But some of this stuff, so I really don't want to even think about it. I mean, some of it's quite mm. painful, and I'm really reluctant to sort of rake it all up, up really. So maybe I'll do it in grey old age. But uh, I've no, I've no real wish to uh, do a lot of that stuff, really. Yeah, I found in my case of rehashing those things, I tend to um, make light of them in certain ways even though they're incredibly serious events in, in one's life, it's the the act of, of talking about it tends to devalue it or, you know, make it seem as though you're somehow blasé, um, which is my solution to being overdramatic about, about things in my life. So, yeah, I get the you know, not wanting to dredge it up at all or fear of representing it in some way that's not a not what you intended, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. That one of the things that stops me is I'm not sure what my approach would be. If I 
think of the right approach. I'm just not at that place where I, I could do this work, that kind of work yet. I think but it's, it's, it's in me, but uh, where I'll ever get there, I don't know. You have plenty of cartooning ahead of you, you know, and, no, and no. you know, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but um, you did mention having to go back to UK sometime soon. Is that a, uh, well, visa-ish stuff or yes, just, just... Is, yeah, I mean, the visa is, um, I've realized abruptly that I'm not, I'm not allowed to stay as long as I would have liked. So within the next week or, or so, I'm going to have to go back, at least for a short while, and then come back perhaps in the spring. Uh, I'll come back to New York. I'm not sure. My hope is by then it'll be safe for us to get together. I don't mean in a, a you know, Putin way, but, you know, the, the whole Omicron wave has, has collapsed. Um, I have been told I should show up to MOCA in early April in Manhattan um, if you're you're back by then and we all feel comfortable being in a crowded space with a bunch of cartoonists and readers. Um Maybe we can actually get to meet up in person. Well, be at great. Last. Um, um, I'm I'm still very wary of um, of um, people. Um, yeah, so am I. Well, conventions <laughs> in particular, but even before there was a pandemic, um, conventions were well known for places you could pick up like a cold and things like that. You know, the, the old con crud. So I'm always aware oh, yeah. of that. And um, the only convention I've been to in during the pandemic was the Lakes Fest. Uh, last autumn, and uh, that was the first one I'd been to uh, since the pandemic began. And of course, I picked up a cold <laughs> there. And of course, I hadn't, because of all the preventative stuff I've been doing, I hadn't even had a cold or anything. Right. So I was a kind of a rude awakening to me with, oh my God, you can still get those as well. <laughs> this nuisance that is at least not the worst thing in the world. No. Yeah, it's, I've gone two years now without any. Any sort of thing. You and it's just been... protecting yourself from a whole range of things, not just COVID. Yeah. In my case, you know, socializing with other human beings. But that's just something to protect myself from. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but yeah, it's a uh, it's pretty harrowing to, to see, you know, what, what the shift is to try to get back to the things that we, you know, took for granted once upon a time. Uh, yeah, it's um, we're living in a new, another age, really, and it's difficult for people like me, uh, an older person, if you like, to adjust to it in some ways because they tend to think, oh, we're going to get back to how it was before. Well, no, we've actually moved on to a new era now. It's not going to be like it was before. This is something new, and we have to. This is this is going to be our our way of living from now on, yeah. in some sense. You know, it's never going to be exactly the way it was before. Right. Endemic rather than pandemic, but still, yeah, that's... that's. Yeah, I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about the political situation. Oh, yeah. As far as that's not going away. You know, the old systems of political thinking are dead. A new age is upon us. Whether it's a good age or a bad age, that's up to us, really. Yeah, I was going to ask the the very end of the book, not to give anything away, but it's nonfiction, so we can do that. You know, is that that question of how you know whether to stand up to authoritarianism? But, I think you always have to, always have yeah. to never relent because you know um, uh, authoritarians will just see what they can get away with, really, and if they can get away with that, they'll push on to the next thing. This is always what they do so you at some point you have to say no this this line and no further you can you're not supposed to go over this line and uh, that's what we've been weak at doing in the west and uh, we've suffered the consequences of that and so yeah. you know and that, yeah, I had, uh, that's uh, nor of authoritarians was... within your own countries as well not just yeah. externally yeah, I I was thinking in terms of the uh, I did one with an episode with Nora Krug recently about illustrating Timothy Snyder's yes, on tyranny. Yeah, and that's you know it's one thing to talk about you know fighting it domestically, you know trying to figure out as a citizen what you do about author authoritarianism in another country becomes difficult, I guess. You know, we're trying to figure out you know how you you mobilize your own country or how you help people in another another region 
Um, it's all part and parcel of the same problem, really. Um, authoritarianism is rising across the world, and uh, what's happening in Britain, what's happening in the US, it's all connected, really. You see the same, often the same sort of figures involved. In the I'm not saying it's some sort of massive, you know, orchestrated conspiracy, but, you know, some, um, the aims of a lot of these people in different countries uh, coincide, so they tend to get together to discuss things. You, you see, ba Bannon has been an advisor in the past to, or at least they've had meetings with Boris Johnson. So that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you, you don't want to get into the you know uh, uh, string board, you know, tying all these these photos together and, and drawing massive conspiracies, no, but you can draw the anti the confederacies, you know. Some kind of conspiracy yeah. kind of person, but on the end on the other hand, Bannon is quite open with what right. he wants. It's not like you're pinning stuff on him that he disagrees with. He flat out says so yeah. you know, in the media <laughs> yeah. every day. I want this, you know. And we've got a system that allows for it. So yeah, how we reconcile all that's going to be the well, the challenge of our age, I guess. Well, it's the struggle that's going on at the moment uh, between democracy and authoritarianism. We have to fight if we can with everything we've got for democracy because it's, it can be swept away very easily, and it's so impossible to get it back. It's really ask any Russian, you know, they had a chance at democracy and they lost it. Yeah, and you look at the. Former Soviet republics who were just yeah you can bring the troops in here U.S. we we're we're fine with you coming in and and helping protect us from this happening again. One thing I would say about the Putin book is that the first victims of Putin and his crime cartel are always the Russian people. I'm not anti-Russian. I'm not anti-Russian people. I'm anti-dictatorship, and I've been accused of being anti-Russian in the past, and that's absolutely not the case. I want Russia to be a democracy. I want Russia to be a free place. It will free us all. If we, it would help free us all if Russia was a, a free democratic place that could run itself. I, I don't think the book counters that at all. I, I don't think you come off as, as anti-Russian at all in this so much as, you know, yeah, reflecting well, what Putin has done to the, the country, the people Green, and the countries Green, around. Green, Greenwald accused me of being anti-Russian. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> I would take that as a badge of honor. I do, all, actually. All honesty, Daryl. <laughs> I do, I do, actually, yeah. Daryl, I'm hoping safe travels with, with the UK. I'm hoping you get back here soonish and that uh, it's safe for us to, to meet up in person sometime this spring. Yeah, it'd be great. Uh, we'll do that um, when the weather is sunnier and warmer and uh, less dangerous in terms yeah. of the pandemic. That'd be great. Thank That's... you. Neil. Thanks for the interview. And that was Daryl Cunningham. His new book is Putin's Russia, The Rise of a Dictator, out now from John and Quarterly. You should pick it up, as well as Daryl's previous book from D&Q, Billionaires, and his other nonfiction work, because he will help you, well, in a sense, sort out the world that we're living in. Now, I can imagine how draining that sort of commitment is, so I am awfully glad Daryl has been taking a break from comic biography and nonfiction and is working on his, uh, well, his ghost slash vampire story that we talked about during the show, Far Beyond Midnight. He's been serializing that on Patreon, literally page by page as he finishes them. And that's at patreon.com slash Acme Daryl, which is A C M E D A R. R Y L. You should support his work there. Um, he posts those things almost every day, except now he's stuck in transit, uh, heading back from New York to UK and getting resettled there. Um, but he's posting really good stuff. He is stretching himself as an artist and a writer with this project. So I'm awfully glad to see that too, in addition to the amazing work he's done most recently with Putin's Russia. Daryl's also on Twitter as Acme Daryl, spelled the same way, uh, but his website, daryl-cunningham.blogspot.com, doesn't look like it's been updated for about a year now. I'll have links to all of this stuff in the show and episode notes for this one. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories show by 
telling other people about it. Uh, let them know there's this guy putting out these conversations every single week with neat, creative people and, uh, you know, exposing you to new and interesting works in books, comics, theater, art, music, all that stuff. Um, you can also support the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you want to see me record with and what aforementioned book, movie, TV show, artwork, piece of theater, whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by sending me a letter or an email or a postcard. I send postcards every day now, a postcard every day now uh, as part of my 2022 resolution. And that's been loads of fun. You can figure out my address relatively easily from the weekly email that I send out. You can also leave me a message at my Google voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about me picking up and getting stuck in a weird conversation with this strange guy who does a podcast. Uh, messages can be up to three minutes long, so if you're going to go real long, keep that in mind. And um, let me know if it's okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. I would never do that without the speaker's approval, but, um, you know, if you leave something and you want people to hear it, just let me know. Now, if you have money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, I keep a Patreon going, but that's a, I don't know what I'm doing that for. I'm doing it so I can fund other artists and, and writers and creators. Uh, what I want you to do, if you have any money or resources to spare, is support other individuals or institutions in need. And you can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Topato Go, uh, and other forms of, of crowdfunding. Um, if you're looking to somewhere to, if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, I give to my local food bank and the Poor People's Campaign. Um, you can look to your local food bank or freedom funds or election funds. Uh, you should also look up Project Blue Dot, B L U E D O T, on Twitter. One of my past guests is running that, where we are trying to fund. Um, trying to fund Democrats in Republican strongholds to try to grow uh, awareness, try to grow that voting block and, um, well, and try to change things. What I'm saying is uh, if you do have money or resources to spare, there are a lot of things you can do to, to try to help make a better world. So I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going.